Welcome back. This is Morgan Stensei. Uh, today we're going to be reviewing Uniform Resolution on Application. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull it up here. We'll dive right on into it. Oh. All right. So, um, first, what is a Uniform Residential Loan Application? Um, this is the primary form that all lenders and banks use in order to qualify you for a home loan. Um, this is a federal standard clear across the board. We all use the same exact thing uh, and is primarily used for any type of, you know, residential mortgage uh, that you will get. Uh, why do we use this specific form? Uh, well, as we stated, uh, this is the official form you, uh, that are that is approved by the federal government, the CFPB. And uh, the reason why we use this, uh, use this one, it gives us a clear understanding of uh, your financial situation, uh, past, current, that way we can project the future in your ability to repay the loan and consider if you are bankable. Now, uh, how do we go about filling this out? So we'll go through each of these pages um, and pretty much in detail, and we'll use a fictional character and I'll explain what's going on as we go. So first and foremost, across the, the top here, uh, this will be, as you can see, completed by the lender right here. This will be completed by the lender, so we'll skip over that. And we'll start in Section 1A, 1A, personal information. So when we're putting in this information here, it's very imperative that we get the most accurate information. All mortgage fraud starts with this form, right? Um, you want to give uh, all accurate information. Uh, don't hide anything. Uh, nothing's worse than, you know, putting something down and then the underwriter uh, finds out something different or more information that you didn't properly disclose to your loan originator uh, who should be asking you these questions, but it doesn't mean, you know, a consumer will be truthful. But just know that we will uh, scrutinize this document, uh, this document here, this form, and we will go about uh, verifying your information through third party sources like the CAVERS report, uh, through the federal government, state government, you know, so and so forth, Social Security. All right, we'll we'll go about the process of verifying this information to make sure everything is accurate and up to date. So first things first, uh, as you can see here uh, with the cursor, uh, we're going to input the, your your name here. So I'll just go ahead and put my name here, Nelson C. Thompson Jr. Okay. Um, if you have an alternate name or anything like that, uh, so let's say you went and had a name change or, uh, you know, you, you're you using an alias or whatever case may be, you know, most of the time we don't fill this in, but if that does apply to you, then you want to make sure you get that information in properly. Moving over to the right box here, uh, you'll just put in your social security number. We'll provide that to your loan app, uh, your loan originator. Um it's normally best that you complete the loan application and then the loan originator uh, reviews it with you for accuracies and changes. Uh, but again, you should know, you know, what your, um, which, what information is being requested of you and why. So then we'll put in a date of birth. Uh, we'll just put today's date. Uh, All right. And then you'll put your citizenship, right? Whether you're a U.S. citizen and so on and so forth. Uh, below that, the next box here with type of credit, um, you'll you'll specify whether you're going to be the only one on the mortgage uh, using your so, your uh, credit report and income dot and asset documentation, or if you're going to be on the loan with someone else, whether it's your spouse, a family member, a friend, uh, anything along those lines. Uh, over to the right here, um, this is where you will start, will start inputting uh, multiple applicants, right? Um, uh, spouses or or uh, any other person that's going to be on the loan with you, they, they start to get compiled here. Going to the next section here, uh, your marital status, right? Whether the person is going to be on the loan with you or not is irrelevant. They're asking you what is your marital status. Some states, um, which are community property states like uh, Arizona is the first one that comes to mind, uh, it matters if you're married and you're going with a government loan. Um, we have to take into account their uh, credit and their liabilities when it comes to you qualifying for home loans. 
other states, like the state I live in, Georgia, it doesn't matter where you married or not, whether that impacts you with your qualification, but you do still need to disclose whether you're married, separated, or unmarried. Uh, here in the state of Georgia, uh, we don't recognize, recognize separation, uh, so just know your state laws. Uh, your loan originator should know them for you, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with you doing your due diligence that way. You're uh, aware of what's going on. Uh, next to the right of that, uh, you have your dependents, right? This is uh, all persons that you claim and or take care of uh, financially, okay? So you can have uh, one, two, however many, you know, kids or grandchildren, parents, or potentially grandparents, or, you know, any siblings, uh, aunts, uncles, whatever, right? Um, we're talking about uh, real persons here. Uh, so, you know, I know we love our, our pet our pet children and stuff like that. It doesn't go here, um, not, not from a standpoint of getting a loan. So I'll just put in uh, something here. All right. Now, when, it, when we're talking about contact information, um, we, we want to get all the best contact information for, for you. All right. Um, each person have a, a different application. Um, but for you, when you're completing this, all of the most accurate information here would, uh, would be best. All right. Now, when it comes to email, this is your personal email address. It is important that you have an email because uh, when you're going through the lending, pro lending process, everything is electronic. We do a lot of DocuSigns, e-signatures, so on and so forth. So you want to put in the email that you check most often, most frequently. That way you can receive your notifications, all communication efforts, and the necessary electronic documents in which you need to uh, sign. Okay. Uh, when it comes to your um, current address, the next section here, this is what your physical address is where you lay your head down at night and go to sleep, right? Uh, if you're staying temporarily over at someone's house or any something like that, you put down the address where you go home and you put your head down to sleep. Uh, not the address where, oh, I just ended my lease, you know, with this place two weeks ago. I don't live there anymore. Uh, I'm living here or a P.O. box, right? None of that, right? It's where your physical place is, where you live, where you, uh, where you live or you rest at night. Now, um, when it comes to this current address, we want to go back as far as a minimum two years. This application is all based off of what has happened within the last two years. Uh, however, if you've been living in the same place longer than two years, then you want to specify that specifically. So the application is asking for a minimum two years, but you can always put more than two years, especially if you've been living in a, a place of residence, you know, three years or longer. So one, two, three, Main Street, uh, Atlanta. All right, now when you get to the section here where it says housing, okay, uh, you're either gonna mark no primary housing expense, you own the property, or you rent or lease the property. Now in the section where you, you, um, you have no primary housing expense, these are common when you, when you live with family or live with a significant other, or you know something along those lines where you're not obligated to um, a mortgage that has your name on it that you have to make payments on, or your name is on a lease uh, or, or where you're obligated to make payments on. Um, so we'll just mark that. Now, if you do rent somewhere, uh, you're going to put down what is your uh, obligated rent, right? I know, you know, you might have rent plus utilities and so on and so forth. Uh, what I tell people specifically is whatever it says you have to pay on that rental agreement, that's the number you want to put down, whatever that is. Okay. Now, moving on from here, uh, again, uh, if, if uh, let's say I stated here less than two years, so let's just put one year here, uh, then I will go in and just put in um, my previous address.
I know that that's a Dallas zip code. All right. Um, and let's say we've been here for three years. All right. And let's say we need to be rented here. There we go. Okay. Now, your mailing address. Um, your mailing address is assumed to be the same as your current address here, unless uh, you specify something different. So let's say it's a PO box or you're having your, your mail go to a secondary residence or something like that, you'll put in a different address. If not, it'll just be does not apply. Now, we're going to move into section 1B. Uh, again, this has to do with uh, current employment and self-employment, um, uh, where you, who you work for, where you work at, what's the contact information for that person, and then your income, right? And when it comes to income, um, it's okay if you're wrong here, right? I, I know people, I know a lot of you may not know how to properly calculate income as a uh, uh, underwriter will. I'll give you a general explanation of what you're looking to do, um, but uh, just do your best and put in the information, but the areas in which you want to be the most accurate on are the following. Number one, your employer and or business name. So if you work for someone, what's the name of the employer? Right? What's the name of the employer? If you, uh, if you, oh, sorry about that. If you own your business, right? What is the name of your business? All right, so you're doing one or the two, okay? Now, when it comes to the telephone number, the telephone number, you want this number not to be how to get in contact with you at your employer. You want this number to be the number to whoever verifies your, your employment status and your income, right? Who has the ability or the right or the task at your job? It may or may not be your manager, right? It may be HR, it may be payroll, it may be an accountant. Uh, we don't really know who it is, right? But the information that you want to provide to us here is going to really help us cut down on the amount of time that's necessary in order to process your loan application. If you go ahead and tell us, hey, this is, uh, you know, Susan here uh, with HR and she's in charge of completing work verifications of employment. Uh, or verbal verifications of employment where they can tell uh, they can tell you, the lender, or tell me uh, my stability, my status, and what is my income uh, breakdown, income breakdown, uh, base, uh, overtime, uh, bonuses, you know, commissions, so on and so forth. So we'll just put in a number here. Okay, now when, when it comes to the address, right, the street address, um, if you work for a large uh, corporation, you're not putting down the main headquarters. When you're putting in the address here, what you're what we're looking for specifically is what is the address that you that you are um, reporting to? What is the address that you go to every day? Right. So, for instance, let's say you work at Target, all right? And Target has its headquarters wherever it is. I don't know it off the top of my head, but you work at your local Target, right? Well, whatever that local address for that target that you go to, right, that's the address that you're going to put down here. So let's go ahead and put something down. All right. Now, when it comes to position titles, uh, this is your current position title, right? Whatever they gave you, like, okay, this is your title, and here's your task, okay? So whatever it is, that's what you put down here. All right, now, when it comes to your start date, you're going to put down whatever was your official start date or your hire date with the company. Ideally, knowing it all the way down to the exact day will greatly help us, but at least put down the month and year if you're not familiar with when exactly uh, you started working with your company. So I'll just put down, uh, let's just put down something here. Okay. Now, 
Under that, where it says, how long have you been in this line of work? Now, this is different from your hire date. What it what it's asking for is how long you've been doing what you've been doing. You may have worked with multiple different employers, but you know, have you always had this similar type of job uh, title? Have you always been in this fi- this line of work? That's more specifically of what we're asking for. Okay. Um, now over to the right where it says uh, check if this statement applies. I am employed by a family member property seller, real estate agent, or other party to the transaction. So what they're saying is uh, the home in which you're looking to buy or refinance, if there's any person involved in that transaction, professional, right, and or the seller, right, any person involved in this transaction that you work for, right, I'm employed for this person, you need to check that box. Under that, let's go here, let's kind of highlight this. There we go. Is that check if you are a business owner or self-employed. So let's say you're filling in all this information. You're self-employed. You got to check that box. It's imperative that that box get checked. That way we can process your loan application correctly. After you check the box of whether you are a business owner or not, uh, you then need to state uh, your ownership interest in the business that you have, whether it's more than 25% or... um, less than 25%, okay? Now, if you are 25% or more, then more documentation is normally going to be required of you because the bank or the lender is going to look at you as more risk assessor, meaning that, you know, uh, you're not dependent on another uh, employer. Therefore, we can't dive into that employer's information um, uh, or more specifically, you own less than 25% of, of a company uh, we don't want to dive into the books and the financials of that company uh, because, you know, uh, it'll be impending on that company to a certain degree because you own less than 25 percent. Uh, you know, we'll consider that you're you're not heavily making a lot of decisions at that company. Um, and then here, if you own the business, of course, you'll put in your income or your loss. Uh, now, this, har- this part here is har- starts to get a little tricky for the employer. Uh, it is based off of your net income plus uh, any um, uh, depreciation, uh, depletion, business home use, um, any type of mileage that you drive. So there's a calculation in which we use. If you don't know exactly what it is, put down what you think it is, send in the required uh, documentation, normally your last two years of tax returns, uh, 1099s, if that applies to you, uh, and then a loan originator professional will be able to calculate it or should know how to calculate it for you. Uh, over here on the right side, okay, let's say you're you're not a business owner, okay? On the right side here, for everyone that's W-2 or work for an employer, uh, then you're going to start itemizing the breakdown in your pay. And yes, each one of these boxes are calculated by the underwriter differently. So it, you can't just put a a general number. Let's say you bring in seven thousand dollars a month. Well, that seven thousand dollars a month includes my my base pay uh, or my salary, right? And also includes um, overtime bonuses, maybe some commissions, right? Well, you don't want to. We don't want to submit it to the underwriter lump like that because potentially when the underwriter looks at your file and does a recalculation, you you may not qualify for what you think you qualify for. Um, so again, this is where the mortgage professional needs to come into play whoever's in a role, a role like myself and properly understand how to properly calculate your income according to how the underwriter or lending guidelines say we should be calculating income. So let's go ahead and put in here. Let's say, um, you know, the base is, uh, I don't know, let's, let's keep it simple, $6,500 uh, and extra, you know, $1,000 in overtime. And maybe, you know, you get a couple bonuses throughout the year and we call that six fifty, right? Something like that, okay? Um, if you get commissions, military and time and so on and so forth, whatever is applicable to you, that's what you put in there. Now, uh, before I, uh, well, no, let's scroll down because it's not a section. Now, uh, let's say here, if applicable, right, uh, complete information. So, again, we're going back two years, right? So, let's say this first employer you worked at only for, you know, a year, six months, three months, right? Whatever the case may be, you have to go in chronological order, right? Just like on a resume, if you list this this company, ABC uh, company, I've been there for three months. The company before I went to ABC company 
was XYZ company. I was there for a year, right? Before XYZ company, I was at LMMOP company and so on and so forth. But we want to go back and spend a minimum two years, unless the same company you've been there longer than two years, just state how long you've been with that company, right? So we can just cover it and the underwriter can, uh, the underwriter is looking for his employer stability, right? That's what we're looking for over the past two years. And then that helps us determine the stability of your qualifying income, which will help you qualify or show repayment ability for the home in which you're looking to get. And that's kind of how it goes. So uh, we have one C, this is filling in the two-year gap. One D is filling in the two-year gap. And now we're down to one E. Now, one E is for all the other type of income that doesn't come from an employer or self-employed uh, business owner type of asset. Uh, now, when you're looking at, you know, the, the different choices, there's a lot of stuff here that's listed. Common things are alimony, child support, uh, any type of uh, Social Security, uh, uh, benefits, VA compensation, retirement, right? Uh, certain public assistance, if you really know what you're doing. But everything that falls here is allowable when it comes to calculating your income, uh, provided that uh, it's considered eligible and the information is accurate. Uh, you'll basically uh, put the income source. So whatever you see here is what you're putting in here. There's no, you're not adding something different, right? And whatever you receive gross from that income is what you put over here, right? So whatever the total amount before deductions, like, uh, so for instance, like Social Security, any kind of Medicaid or anything like that, any type of deductions or whatever that they take out, you want to put the total number and that's what you what you put in here. And you can have as many of them, you can list as many, um, you know, sources of income provided that they are qualified and that they are eligible for your loan approval. Moving on down. Now we're in section two, right? Now, section two, if I can explain this, this is, uh, this is going to take into account, like you said, your, as you can see there, your assets and liability. What we're looking for is two things. You already told us what your income was. Assets and liability section is where we're going to start bringing together your cash flow or your debt to -get income ratio, and we're going to be bringing in your liquidity, aka your net worth, right? That's where we're going to start bringing it all together and it's really going to start to make sense. So in section 2A, uh, this is uh, assets. Right. Um, this is all considered cash value assets, cash value assets. Um, please refer to uh, my previous video where there are, when we talk about funds, the difference between a cash value asset and an appraised uh, value asset. Um, so cash value means easy liquid, right? Easy liquid cash. You may have to complete a couple of forms, wait a couple of days, something like that, uh, especially if you're liquid, liquidating a 401k. But that's what we're referring to here. Uh, you specify uh, which account type it is. There's, as you can see, there's uh, quite a few drop downs here. All right. Uh, you put the name of the financial institution, the account number, and then what is the cash value or the market value of the account. Now, in this section here, I know some people are like, oh, man, I don't want to let the bank know what I got and blah, 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 and this, this, and that. Uh, keep in mind that the more money that you show, you show to the bank or to the lender, um, the more bankable you look, meaning that, okay, I have the money available to bring to closing, right? My closing costs, my down payment, so on and so forth, right? And I have reserves, uh, meaning I have money left over after this all said and done. We close, I own the home. I have money standing aside in reserve in case I fall into hardship of, of some kind, meaning that maybe, you know, heaven forbid, I... I lose my job or I get in an accident or something like that. I have I have this much liquidity sent off to the side that can be uh, tapped into in case something goes, uh, you know, the way that we're not planning here, right? So you just put in the information, the more the merrier, right? But just remember, no, whatever you put on this application, we're verifying, right? So the more you put on, the more it needs to be verified. So um, uh, talk to a professional, make sure you're doing it accurately. Uh, normally, what I do is I put in just enough information that, that I know the loan is going to get done. Anything else above, beyond that, leave it off the tape. That's normally the best way to go about it. But again, if you want to put everything on there, you know, have at it.
Next, uh, we have uh, 2B, which is other assets uh, and credits you have. <laughs> now, when we're, when we're talking about here, right, this is where stuff starts to get a little funky, okay? Um, and funky in a good way, but sometimes funky in a bad way. So uh, let's talk about these, these sections here. So first type of assets, proceeds from a real estate property to be sold on on or before closing. So that what it's saying is that you have a home that you're going to sell before you close on this home that this application is for. Uh, so, of course, you know, the money from the sale of this property is not currently sitting in your account. It's not. Uh, but it will be there. And here's a listing uh, or here's the contract or here's the hub one statement showing when we're closing and that the funds are going to be available. Uh, next right here, proceeds from a sale of a non real estate, real estate asset. So this is like um, uh, boats, cars, jewelry, precious metals, like, you know, gold, you know, so and so forth, stones, all that good stuff. Right. Um, now, the key thing here is proceeds from sale of non real estate asset. And what we're saying here is that you are going liquid. Now, uh, whenever you do something like that, in my previous video, when I talk about funds, um, if you're going to sell um, those assets within two months of your application, keyword, within two months of your application, then you need to have them assessed and appraised. Uh, if you sold them more than 61 days before you started the application, make sure the money's in the bank. That way we don't have to do a whole lot of tracing and sourcing and so on and so forth, okay? But... This is all based off of within two months of the application. That's a little telltale that that's uh, that's a little gem for all those that's watching. Uh, all right. Now, the next thing is secure borrower funds. Secure borrower funds mean that it's normally the only thing that um, um, uh, it's either. Well, how can I explain it? So secure means a loan that you get that is backed by real estate or a loan that's get from your car, uh, from a boat. Uh, any type of uh, real or personal property, right? Real or personal property. And it's secured by their real or personal property, okay? That's what it means by secure borrower funds. Uh, unsecured borrower funds here, unsecured borrower funds is like a personal loan, credit card, you know, things like that. That's not secured by real or personal property. It's secured by your promise to repay. And that's totally different. Uh, when it comes to those monies that you get from an unsecured borrow funds, if that has been obtained uh, within the last two months, or the loan or the uh, or, is, uh, or it's been shown on the credit report within the last two months of the application, normally the underwriter isn't going to take it because it's considered unsecured, and that and that's just not allowed, right? Just, just plain and simple, it's just not allowed. So uh, try to stay away from unsecured borrowed funds unless you really, really know what you're doing. I've done it before to help a person get into a home with unsecured uh, borrowed funds, but it is a process. So if you want to know more about that, just talk to me. Um, and then other, you know, like just like I said, any other type of uh, monies that you're planning on bringing to the table, um, you know, of course, we want to keep it legal. So if you're doing any type of illegal activity, uh, you know, federal, state, whatever. You know, we, we can't be out here, you know, tra trafficking or drug dealing or, you know, scamming, stuff like that. Like, that's not going to work, right? This is above the board. I'm always above the board. So if you're looking to get around the system, I'm not the person for you, okay? I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not the person for you. Uh, after that, let's talk about credits, okay? Uh, credits, just like it sounds, this is credits that's going to be applicable towards your uh, loan calculation, the loan approval. Um, first is earnest money. Earnest money is basically um, you're going on a contract for purchase. Uh, now you have to bind that contract by some type of monetary value, uh, which is normally considered liquid cash, right? Uh, so um, for those that never went into home ownership before, uh, when you go into a lease, no, uh, they may ask for a security deposit uh, in in a purchase of home ownership. Uh, instead of saying security deposit, we're saying earnest money. That's all it is. Now, earnest money, it will be applied to whatever your cash due at closing. 
Um, and normally, at minimum, it goes towards the down payment or the closing costs or something along those lines. So it is always credited towards the total number that you need to bring to closing. That's why it says credits. Uh, relocation funds. Uh, relocation funds is basically what it sounds like. You work for an employer and the employer said, hey, if you move from uh, California to Georgia, we're going to pay you $10,000 for the trip because we really need some people out here in Georgia. Well, that's a credit that you're getting from your employer, location funds, or any other thing that falls into that category. There's, there's other you know, types, but that's just one. Um, sweat equity, okay? Sweat equity mean, uh, means that you're doing something for the seller and, and they're giving you equity for it, right? They're, they're building it into the contract, right? Whatever the case may be. Um, that's through and through what it means. Uh, employer insistence, right? Now, employer insistence is a little bit different from relocation funds. Em employer insistence means that, okay, I'm buying a house. Uh, I told my employer what I'm doing. And the employer was like, you know what? You've been such a great employee. We're going to give you $5,000 to help you buy your house, right? This is a one-time thing. It's not reoccurring. It's not because we need you to do something for us. It's just because we want to help you get into a home because we, we want to look out for you. employer assistance. Um, rent credit. So let's say you are, these are common with uh, lease purchases, right? Lease purchases. So you're, you're renting from your landlord, right? And you have it set up in the contract that a certain portion of your monthly payments uh, are being saved in an escrow account, uh, which it should be saved in an escrow account. You don't want to leave it up to the landlord to try to save it for you. But it's being saved into an escrow account that you can tap into once you're ready to buy the home uh, that you're living in, right? Or they'll... they'll uh, credit it back to you once you leave the home. I've seen that too. Uh, so I'm renting somewhere. They're saving money up in my rent payment. Uh, once I terminate my lease with them to go over here to buy this house, uh, the money that I've been stacking with them comes to me as a rent credit. Boom. And then I can go use that towards the purchase of my new home. Um, trade equity. Uh, trade equity, we see this a lot with uh, manufactured homes, right? That's the most common occurrence when I see a trade equity. And the trade equity is um, uh, I have, I'm going to buy this manufactured home, right? Or this, this uh, uh, here's a more common thing. Uh, I'm buying a manufactured home. Uh, I may or may not own the land, but I already have a manufactured home. And I'm going to trade this manufactured home for a new home for a new manufacturer home. And the manufacturer is going to give me the trade equity or the difference in the trade, right? So let's say my home, my, the trade of my manufacturer home is worth $100,000, right? And uh, the modular home that I'm getting is $200,000. Well, the trade equity is $100,000, right? So we got to atomize all of that. And that's, that's where it comes from. Uh, lot equity, okay? Now, lot equity means um, you, you see this a lot when you are uh, buying, uh, or I'm sorry, when you own the land free and clear. Here's the most common. You own the land free and clear, and uh, you are, um, in essence, uh, putting a, a structure on it, right? Uh, in those instances, you can use the equity of the lot towards your closing costs, right? Or let's say you're uh, buying uh, land from, um, uh, or you're, you're being gifted land from a family member, right? So a family member owns an acre of land, right? And they're going to, uh, or they own 10 acres of land, and they're going to parcel off one acre. So they're going to rezone it, set it up with the county, one acre. And they're going to uh, give this, this land to you, and you're going to build a house on it. Well, then that land is worth $25,000, so to speak, right? Depending on where you're at. It could be more, it could be less. But it's $25,000. Well, that $25,000 of lot, a lot equity is built up in that dirt, in that real property, right? Well, we can utilize that because it's, it's equity. And we utilize that towards the down payment or towards the, uh, the closing costs, right? So those are different examples of lot equity. Again, 
Uh, you'll put in, you know, whatever it is. You can see there's a drop down of all of that good stuff here. And then you put, to the best of your knowledge, whatever the cash or market value is for that particular asset or credit, asset and credit. All right, now, section 2C. Section 2C uh, is basically what is showing on your credit report, right? What is showing on your credit report or should be showing on your credit report, okay? Now, uh, as you can see, revolving accounts, uh, examples, credit cards, right? Installments, student loans, personal loans, open accounts, and then lease, leases, right? Uh, you can check out my, my uh, crash course on credit. I go over these four sections specifically. There is a other, but we normally don't see a other. Um, but these are the four sections. The other would be considered like uh, collections. You know, that's normally considered other. Um, but this is, this is what prevails here. Now, normally what occurs is where we just pull off what's on your credit report, right? Whatever shows on your credit report. <coughs> But there may be instances where you have debt that's not reporting on the credit report that we pull. For instance, um, normally when you're going through a pre-approval process, uh, uh, the, the proper way is to do a hard credit check. Well, that hard credit check, that credit report is valid for 120 days. Uh, so you need to find a house to go on the contract, ideally within 90 days or within a couple of weeks of doing the pre-approval. But with, let's say, you know, 90 days pass by, you haven't found a house. Uh, but you don't, you have found a house now. Uh, and now you're gonna you want to close. Well, we can still use that credit report provided that we close within that 120 days of the credit report. Well, let's say during that time frame, you want to open up new debt, right? Well, that wasn't showing on the credit report that I have from you 60 days ago. In the last 60 days, you got a credit card or you had a let's maybe uh, I've seen this happen sometimes. Um, you know, you have trouble with your car, you got into a car accident, heaven forbid, you know, hopefully you're okay. And you had to go get a new auto, you had to get a new car. Well, that's not showing on the credit report that I have. Uh, so we will have to go in and manually input that information. Uh, but basically, you know, we'll specify the account type, as you can see here, the company name, the account number, the balance, the unpaid balance, or the amount you still owe, right? Whether you're going to be paying it off at or before closing, right? and what the minimum monthly payment is. Minimum, not what you're going to pay, what you want to pay. We want the minimum obligated payment that the creditor or the company has stated that you need to pay them. Uh, we'll list them all out. And, you know, it can be a little, little a couple of accounts. I've seen, you know, north of 30 accounts uh, on some application I've done in my 10 year career. Uh, but neither here nor there, we'll get them all on there, make sure everything is accurate and, and proceed accordingly. Uh, now, the liabilities and your income, that those two directly affect your debt to income ratio and the following, which is 2D. 2D is other liabilities, right? Now, when we talk about other liabilities, this is where the CAVERS report tends to come in, CAVERS. Um, the CAVERS report, if I can sum it up, is any liens and cover resist judgments or filings through the court system, right? So think about, as you can see here, alimony, child support, separate maintenance, job-related expenses, other. Other can be IRS repayment, state repayment, right? Local repayment, right? Um, any, any type of judgment that may be upon you or something like that that you got to make payments to, right? We're going to list all of this, whatever it is, and then we're going to put what your minimum obligated monthly payment is, and that debt is included in your total debt-to-income ratio calculation. Scrolling on down. Section three, your financial information, dealing with real estate, right? Now, 3A is property that you own. Property that you own. Now, this can be uh, real estate. Now, this is always real property, okay? Not, pro not personal property. <coughs> but uh, this could be residential. It could be commercial. And it can be vacant land or a lot, right? Um, it's best to put everything down. It's best to put everything down. Even, Nelson, even if it's vacant land, yeah, even if it's vacant land, because that vacant land, you got to pay property taxes on it, right? Or you might have a land loan on it, right? Uh, if it's in your name, you, you need to put it on here. Now, if you have it in a trust name, or if you have it in a business name, or something like that, you don't need to put it down. 
it's it's whether the the person uh, is is whether that real property is in your personal name, registered in your personal name through the county, right? Or bagged by your personal social security number, right? Or if you are a grantor on the loan, right? I know some business owners kind of do that, right? Oh, well, the loan is in my business name, but I'm a grantor on it. Hey, you're a grantor on it. It, it needs to be here. It needs to be specified. It needs to be outlined. Um, you don't want to commit any kind of mortgage fraud, right? Um, and that's a hefty penalty, you, up to 30 years in jail and a million dollar fine. So uh, the government takes that very, very serious. If you know you have debt out there, you know you have monthly payments out there, and uh, you don't list it on the application, uh, we're just trying to repeat 2007 and 2008 all over again. That's one of the problems, right? Everybody was at fault, not just the bank, not just the not just the uh, the, the loan originator, right? Not just Wall Street, but the consumer was at fault too. You knew you wasn't making that money and you put it down there anyway, right? So let's all be above the board. Let's do it the right way. We can get into homes if we do it the right way. Uh, so you'll put in the street address, right? You'll put in the property value. You can see here, uh, you'll state whether you're going to sell it uh, uh, or if it has sold, I'm sorry, if it's pending sale, meaning that it is listed on the market. Like I'm going to sell this uh, before closing right it's not sold but i'm i'm going to sell this before closing or or if you want to retain it meaning uh i may sell it but i'm not selling it before closing i want to make sure i make the difference in the, in that equation uh your intended occupancy whether it is an investment property whether it's your primary residence whether it's a second home or whether it's it's an other right so let's say it's uh it's a split it's a vacation rental and a second home right it could be other right <clears throat> then you're going to put down the monthly ins uh, insurance, so your homeowner's insurance, uh, your, your monthly property taxes, and your monthly homeowner's association or community dues, right? Now, if, if, these, uh, if those monthly payments are not included in the monthly mortgage payment, you put them down. But if you escrow, meaning the monthly payment you make on this, on this mortgage for this real property, it includes property taxes and homeowner's insurance. Don't put it here because now we're double dipping, right? But if it's not included, you put it down. Uh, if you are renting it and, and you're collecting rent for a two to four unit right here, but in all actuality, I don't know why they put it like there, but we're, you put down anyway, if you are renting, um, so two to four unit property or investment property, there we go. Uh, if you are renting the property, this number that you're putting here, um, it'll be one or two things, right? Because it's based off of how we calculate as a loan originator. So either A, you're putting down the gross rent, what you're, pick, what you're bringing in gross off the lease, or we're putting down the net rent. So that means the loan originator has went in and we calculated the rental income. We, we you know, added back depreciation and, you know, so and so forth. We, take, we took it out maintenance costs. We've taken out uh, property management costs. And then we put the net income. So we're doing one of the two, whichever information that we have. And then um, for the lenders to calculate, this is where we're going to put in the net monthly rental income. So this is what you put in. This is what we put in, right? What we put in matters. What you put in helps us, okay? All right. Now, uh, mortgages on this property. So you want to specify what mortgages are attached to this property that you listed, right? The creditor's name account number, the monthly payment, the balance is still owed, whether it will be paid off at closing or be before closing, and the type of loan it is, and uh, the credit limit, right? So let's say you got a, a home equity line of credit, okay? You're going to put the credit limit, and then you put the unpaid balance, if you will, and you'll put that in for the property address. Now, if you own multiple properties, then you know we'll we'll provide an addendum and we'll get those multiple properties added. But this is just the basics. Uh, you want to put that there. I know this is only one and it goes to section four. But if you own more than you know two homes, right? The current home you live in and and all the other homes that you own, right? Um, we want to get every single one listed. Every single one listed, as long as it's in your personal name. Is in a business entity name or some, or in a trust or something like that, different entity, then um, we're not putting it on the loan application because uh, it's not personal, 
right? It's not under your personal name or under your social security number. All right, moving on from here, section number four, uh, loan uh, and property information. Now, this is for, this is the information for the home in which the new loan is going on and the information on the type or what the terms are for the loan that you're getting for the home that is going on, okay? So the loan amount, this is your, um, uh, it could be your base loan amount or your total loan amount, but it's normally your total loan amount, right? So let's say you're going with FHA or VA or USDA, for example, and you have uh, those upfront mortgage insurance premium or your, or your funding fees, right? That needs to be added. Uh, it'll be adjusted accordingly. If you got a conventional loan, this doesn't really apply to you. But the loan amount, uh, normally the lender or the loan originator would specify this and set this up for you. Um, the loan purpose, whether you plan on purchasing, uh, so that means this, this loan is going on a home that you currently don't own, or you're refinancing, meaning that this loan is going on or replacing a loan that you currently have on a home, or uh, the loan is going on a home uh, that you already own. So you don't have, you own the house free and clear, and you're just pulling the equity out of the home, right? Uh, and then other, um, when it comes to other, other is, is, you know, I don't really touch this, right? Because it normally falls into purchase and refinances, right? But if you're talking about other, other could be considered like a reverse mortgage, right? You can throw something like that in there uh, because that's not really a, so much a refinance. Um, now, going to the next thing, property address, right? So property address is what is the physical address for the property in which the new loan is going on, right? And you put the address here. You put the number of units, whether it's a, a single family resident or one unit property, which means one family, or well, mostly families can live in there, but there's only one meter. That's normally what it means. One meter is on, on, the, on the home uh, or there's multiple units uh, and, and uh, the units are separated. Like you can't get from unit one to unit two through the inside of the overall structure. You got to go out, go all the way around, and get to it. Um, uh, AUDs, the uh, alternate, uh, I'm sorry, ADUs, alternate dwelling units, that's not applicable here, right? We're talking about separate units. Uh, property value, how much is the home worth as is? How much is, the pro how much is the home worth as is, to the best of your knowledge? <laughs> and now your occupancy, right? What do you actually plan on doing with this property? Now, there, here I see a lot of, this is where a lot of mortgage fraud starts to kick in. On, on the consumer side, right? You know you're going to be renting this property out as an investment, but you want to buy it as a primary because you like primary interest rates, right? You, you can't do that. That's mortgage fraud, right? And, or, or I see this on the same front. A loan originator uh, is structuring your loan now and in order to make your loan look better, they structured it as a primary residence, but they know you're going to be buying it as an, as an investment property. Uh, and now, you know, but they, they don't want to show you investment property rates because you probably won't get to deal with them. But, but you go through the process of going on the contract, paying for the appraisal, doing the application fee, whatever the case may be. And then, oh, well, well we, we need to fix it before closing. And now they switch everything to investment property. And now your interest rate, you know, just by half or a full, you know, percentage point. And now you got more costs involved, right? Um, but let's just explain them. So primary residence. Primary residence means this. You are living in the home more than 50% of the year. So 51% or more out of the year. Meaning that, um, you know, it's six months in a year, right? So six months, and one, uh, six months and one day out of the year, I'm going to be living at this home. All of my mail. Uh, what I'm filing with the IRS, what I'm filing with the state as my homestead, my primary residence, that's the address, okay? Second home, meaning I don't live there as my primary residence, not my primary residence, but I am not utilizing the, pro the property to generate revenue or to generate income. Um, now, if it's vacant land, is always invested, right? If it's commercial, it's, it's invested, right? We're talking about uh, what would be considered primary resident type of properties, uh, single family residents, condos, townhouses, manufactured home, mobile homes, you know, up to four units or so duplex, triplex, fourplex, right? Um, all of that can be considered a second home, right? A second home. Um, 
But again, just be honest, right? Just be honest. Uh, when you try to cut corners, when you try to finesse it, you know, when you try to rig it, right? That's when stuff starts to fall apart. Um, you know, you the underwriter will do their due diligence. They're going to look at all your supporting documentation. They're going to research third party uh, information. And if they determine that, okay, you said this is going to be your primary residence, but from what I can determine, this is not going to be your primary residence. You know, either A, your loan is getting denied, or B, there is a complete loan restructure and your terms and conditions are going to change. And it may or may not make sense for you at that point. So it's better to just get it all right up front and then make a, de a decision based off of sound, accurate information. That way we can all, you know, move forward accordingly. <laughs> investment property. Uh, investment property basically means um, you're not utilizing it as a primary residence or a second home. It is a, an investment property. Notice I said you are not utilizing it as your primary or second home. The reason I say it like that is because vacant land is considered investment. Well, you're not going to be using vacant land as a second home. I mean, you could, you know, I'll be honest. Uh, um, I forgot what movie that was or what TV show it was, but it was the guy that was a nurse and he owned the land. Uh, I can't think of the guy, man. Uh, it's, he, but he was a nurse. He owned the land. And, you know, he was building his house one episode at a time. I remember to the, to a certain point, he had just a front porch and, you know, he owned the, he, that was his primary residence, right? Uh, I know, I know some people that maybe own the land and you have a trailer or uh, I knew, I knew a guy, he owned, he owned vacant land and had a tent out there. He was like, man, you know, I'm not ready for no one. I don't have enough money to buy a house. Uh, and he was a camper guy. He was like a mountain man. He bought the land. He pitched this nice, you know, nice tent. He just lived lived on his land, lived in the tent. You know, stuff like that. I get it, it being your primary residence in those scenarios. But if you're not doing that type of stuff, it's an investment property. Now, <clears throat> FHA second residence. So uh, what this means is that your, your current loan on this property, right? Now, FHA, you can't buy a second residence. That's not what they're saying. But there are situations where you can buy a primary residence under FHA and now you own that property and now you're you're you bought a new home somewhere else right and that's your primary residence <coughs> excuse me but that current property that you have it has the FHA loan on it and now you're doing a refinance or FHA screen loan and you're keeping it as FHA that's what that means FHA secondary residence okay uh now mixed use property right um then, if you will, occupy the property when you set aside a space within the property to operate your own business, right? Operate your own business. Now, I know there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, at-home business. I mean, as you can see, you know, I, I work from home. Um, that's, that's not the same case of what we're talking about, here, right? Mixed-use property means that a portion of it is zoned for commercial-type use, daycare facility, medical office beauty, barbershop, something like that, right? Uh, if you're just doing some at-home stuff, you know, a business home use, you know, that's different from running a full-fledged business where you're going to be running traffic, like some real serious traffic through your house, right? That's what it means by mixed-use property. You may have to rezone a portion of it, you sublet a, a portion of it, right? Uh, you section a, uh, a section of it off, right? That's more specific. Like, for instance, there, there are situations where I've seen uh, people buy a single family residence, right? And uh, they convert their garage, right? They section off the whole garage away from their, their, the rest of the property. And um, that garage, they turn into a full blown, um, uh, it was a, a mechanic shop. And people bring in their cars and they work on it right there. That's a mixed use property, right? You section it off for commercial use. And you're you're running a business completely out of your home. That's you know the underwriter. I'm oh, sorry, the appraiser come by. They see that they're like, yeah, no, that's mixed use. That's a commercial type of setup. It's it's cut off from the rest of the house. And it's clearly is a it's a workspace. Yeah, no, this is mixed use. <clears throat> so know the difference, right? And not all lenders like that. That's why the question's there and it's there specifically. Uh, manufactured home, right? So a uh, manufactured home, as you can see, is factory built, right? Uh, and then it's, it's brought to the, to the site 
and then it is permanently attached to the ground. It's fixed to the ground. It can't move. You can't hook, hook it to a, uh, a truck or something like that and drive off with it. But the structure in itself, the majority of the home is built in a manufactured warehouse, right? And then uh, if you've ever been driving down the street and you've seen those, what it look like homes driving down the street on these big old 18 wheelers and it's got the, it got the wide load and they're taking up two, three lanes, you know, um, those are manufactured homes going to the, the site or the lot or the land uh, in order to be affixed to the ground in most cases. All right. So uh, you'll mark whether it's a yes or no. Uh, FYI, we do manufactured homes as well, modular homes as well. So um, is a, the manufactured home side note is a great way for people to realize home ownership that may not be able to qualify for the amount that, of house that's going on in the area. For instance, here in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, if you want to be anywhere desirable, you're you're easily you know four fifty five hundred thousand dollars or more. Right now, there's there's situations or more in the outskirts in a new developed area you might be able to get around that three hundred thousand uh, mark. Uh, if you get in those in between towns of the major cities, you might you know land somewhere around the 200, 250. I've seen as low as one seventy five. But if you're looking for a home that's around a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, or, or something like that, you're looking at a manufactured home, right? And and if that's all if, if that's all what you qualify for, no problem, right? Again, the goal here is home ownership, right? And if all you can afford is a hundred thousand dollars, then let's do it, right? If you can if if you can't afford a hundred thousand dollars is less than that, then let's do it, right? But we just got to be realistic about what's available in your market and and probably get you set up, right? And get you into a home. All right, scrolling on down. Uh, so 4B, are there other new mortgages on the property you are buying or refinancing? So what they're saying is that, okay, this subject property that you're getting this new loan on, are you getting a second, third loan on this at the same time? So you will see this when it comes to um, uh, a 90-10-10 a uh, or a down payment assistance type of loan that requires a second mortgage, right? We'll see that on those type of loans, okay? Um, and um, um, we just got to specify, okay, I'm buying this house, I'm refinancing this house, and I'm getting a secondary loan with it as well. Well, that secondary loan has a monthly payment on it as well, and, and that will affect your debt-to-income ratio. So we want to make sure we, we get all the figures in there. It'll, it'll affect your debt-to-income ratio, and it'll affect your loan to value ratio or how much uh, how, how much in loans you have versus the value of the property, right? Because some lenders like, uh, we're not exceeding a certain percentage in loan to value. Uh, but of course, put the creditor name, what lien position is. Lien position means um, uh, chain of title, right? Who's obligated to get, get paid first in a chain of title? Uh, most lenders always want to be first, right? Unless it's a true second mortgage or home home equity line of credit, whatever, they'll go into a subordinate lien, second, third, whatever position, right? Um, so if you don't know, ask your mortgage professional or ask the lender to get more clarification. But we want to make sure we know the lien type. Uh, you'll put in the, the minimum monthly payment. Uh, they may include taxes and insurance or whatever it is you'll put it in. Here, uh, the loan amount uh, or, or amount to be drawn Right, so the loan amount is what's the balance on 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 the home? What's the balance that I owe? <clears throat> if you get a home equity line of credit, uh, but you but when you got it, there's nothing on it, but you know you're gonna pull money off of it. Put down how much you're gonna put over it, on it off of it, and then the credit limit. Uh, you'll put you know what your your limit is for the home equity line of credit, how much you can pull off of. It, okay. All right, going down to four C. Uh, Rental income on the property you want to purchase, right? So um, there are situations where you can go out there, you can buy a home, especially like uh, duplexes, uh, fourplexes, triplexes, stuff like that, right? And you want to buy this house and the other units are already rented, right? So I'm going to buy a fourplex. There's, there's, there's four units. I'm going to live in one unit. The three other units uh, that I'm looking to purchase already have people living in the home that's paying rent. Well, you can use the rent that they're paying to help you qualify for a home, for the home that you're looking to buy. 
So in this section here, um, you just put in, you know, what the the expected rent is, right? You may know what it is, may not. You can ask the uh, the listing agent or the selling agent or your buying agent, right? And they'll tell you what the, the gross rents are. And, you know, we'll get that. We'll get the supporting documentation, everything supporting documentation. Uh, and then we'll put it in. We'll help you. We'll use that to help you qualify for that uh, multi-unit property. Or the, 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 uh, let's say you're buying a, um, a single family residence, right? And there's a, um, a uh, ADU. Uh, alternate dwelling unit that's on a, on the property, right? So you you you're buying a land. Let's say you got an acre, right? And you're, the primary residence is here, and then there's a separate structure on the land that's actually being rented out right now. Well, you can use that to qualify for a home, right? Um, all right, moving on. 4D uh, gifts or grants that that have been given to you or you will receive before closing on this home or before clear to close to be more specific on this loan. Uh, now the gifts and grants, as you can see, community nonprofit, something you get from the federal government, uh, a relative family member, uh, something you get from your state, uh, something you're getting from the lender, something you get from your employer, uh, something you're getting from a local agency, a religious nonprofit like a church, an uh, unmarried partner, meaning your your girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, some you know non-gender roles. I, I don't know, whatever you know, uh, they give you whatever, and uh, other anything you get that's considered other, right? And then you'll put the gift, uh, whether it's a cash gift, a gift of equity, a grant, right? So a cash gift means uh, they're giving you the money, right? Now when we say cash gift, we we as a lender we don't want you to go out there and get you know, cash, like physical cash, right? Even though it says cash gift, we don't like cash because we need to source where that money comes from. Meaning we got to track exactly how that money got for, got from the donor to you, right? So we want to see it coming out of a cash value asset. Remember the section we saw earlier with the bank statements and so on and so forth? Well, those are considered cash value assets. And if it's coming from someone that's not involved in the transaction or on the loan application, this is considered a cash gift to you, but we can track that it came out of their account. Here's the receipt. Here's here's it showing up in my account. That's how we track the flow of the money. Uh, a gift of equity. Again, we talked about uh, a gift of equity coming from uh, maybe you buying a home uh, from a relative, and um, uh, the home has equity in it. And let's say the home is worth uh, four hundred thousand dollars, right? And your your grandma is going to sell it to you, right? Your uncle, whatever, right? Is going to sell it to you. Uh, instead of selling it to you at four hundred thousand dollars, they're going to sell it to you at three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Where there's a gift of equity of fifty thousand dollars that you can use towards your loan. Uh, a grant, a grant is just what it means. It means money that you are getting normally from an uh, agency or um, a business entity or the government or something like that, that is not obligated to repay you, all right? All of this is considered money coming to you that you are not obligated to pay back, okay? Now, deposit or not deposit. Deposit means the money is in your account already. It is best to go ahead and get the money, all right? Now, I know some uh, relatives may not give you the money until you or until they know you're going to get this loan, right? Uh, but if there's a situation in which uh, money is being gifted to you or given to you or, or granted to you, um, then it is considered a deposit if it's already in your account. If it's not in your account, then it is not deposited. That's it. It's not a deposit, meaning that they said they're going to give it to me, but it's still in their account. They're just waiting until, you know, we know for a fact we're closing. Uh, because you think about it, right? If you're, if you're, getting, uh, if you're getting money from a relative, right? I see this a lot. You get gift from your relative, right? And the relative's like, yeah, I'll give them the money <laughs> once, once we're clear to close and once we're finna close. Well, you can't get clear to close until we show the, the money is available, indeed available and, and ready to go, right? So so how does that work out? Well, you know, we'll get all the way down to, you know, the last condition on the, on the loan approval uh, sometime, and then we communicate. Normally we want, we want to clear uh, credit, 
uh, DTI and property program, uh, clear title, insurance, all that good stuff, right? We got pretty much everything done. And all we need, all we need now is the money, right? Um, and then we'll communicate that, especially if it's a fast situation where we can liquidate and move the money over, uh, or they can deposit the money right with the um, right with the closing attorney um, here in Georgia. We use closing attorney, but the relative can deposit the money with the closing attorney. It's held by the closing attorney uh, uh, until we close. Now, uh, for whatever reason, right? Um, if you don't close, let's say you change job or something like that, you get fired, you quit. Um, you know, you change your mind on the property that you want to buy, or something like that. <laughs> then the money will go back uh, to the respective parties, right? Because it's not considered uh, uh, earnest money, right? Unless, unless they give up the earnest money, then that's a whole other conversation you're gonna have uh, with your loan originator and with your realtor. All right, the source, right? Now, this is what I was talking about: source. So, source is the person or the entity in which the money is coming from. Okay. And then the cash value or the market value. How, how much is it in dollars? All right, now, section five, declarations. So now we're, we're starting to wrap up the loan application here. Uh, but declarations, when we're filling this out, uh, this is you um, giving, uh, answering any specific questions that can have a bearing on your loan qualification. And this is all about your, your past financial history. So let's just try to kind of go through it. Uh, so 5A, uh, about this property and your money for this loan. Section A, or part A. Will you occupy this property as your primary residence? So it's asking you the loan that the home, I'm oh, sorry, the home in which the loan is going on to, the real property in which the loan is going on to, will you be living there as your primary residence? Yes or no? That's it. Yes or no? That's simple. Uh, if yes, have you had ownership interest in another property within the last three years? So it's actually in the last three years, have you owned another property? Primary, second home, investment property, vacant land. Uh, um, well, in this case, they're actually more about residential, to be honest. You could say vacant land and commercial property is yes, kind of kind of um, push that matter, right? But really, they're actually for real property in this scenario. What they're trying to determine, really to explain it, they're trying to determine, are you a true first-time home buyer? To be, to be considered a true first-time home buyer means that you have not had ownership interest in a property, residential property, within the last three years. That's why that question really is there. Um, if yes, complete the, uh, the below. Uh, number one, what type of property did you own? Was it your primary residence? Was it a FHA secondary residence? A second home? An investment property, right? That's what they're asking for. Residential real property is really what they're talking about here. Again, um, residential property is a single family residence um, oh, okay, or one to four units. So that's uh, it's a duplex, triplex, fourplex, condos, uh, townhouses, manufactured home, modular homes, right? Uh, those are considered um, uh, residential properties, right? Uh, mixed use properties. Uh, that's more on the commercial side, commercial lending uh, or commercial properties, office buildings, you know, so on and so forth. That's all commercial stuff. Uh, vacant land, lot, that's, that's all commercial stuff, right? Residential properties, more what they're talking about. Uh, number two, uh, how did you hold title to the property? So what was the deed of the title of the property? Was it in your name only? Was it jointly with your spouse? Or was it jointly with another person or a business entity, right? That's what it's asking for. Uh, line B, if this is a purchase, do you have a family relationship or business affiliation with the seller of the property? Meaning the person in which you're buying this home from, right? Are they your family member? Are they a business? Do you, do you have business affiliation with this person, right? It matters, yes or no. Uh, line C, are you borrowing any money for this real estate transaction, money for your closing costs or down payment, or obtaining any money from another party, such as a seller or realtor that you have not disclosed on this application? It is very important that you are honest. 
right here. Um, loans can get denied on you answering this wrong, right? Now, uh, uh, for instance, let's say uh, I, I've been in uh, I've been in situations, and um, this is kind of early in my career, and I I was working with a client, and uh, I was telling him, hey man, it's gonna cost you know this much money. Uh, we just throw ten thousand dollars out. It's gonna cost you ten thousand dollars to get this home, right? Your credit's there. You make enough income, right? The program's good. Everything looks good, right? This is how much you need to make or how much you bring to the table. Now, the guy had the money in his bank. Fantastic, okay? Now, once he got the pre-approval, he, you know, he kind of went crazy. <coughs> oh, this is the same cash, man. I got this loan in the You know, it's not over until the loan is closed. So the guy spent the money, right? Um, he spent the money. And went after, I think, blew the money on going on vacation or, or, you know, Big Daddy or whatever you want to call it. Um, he borrowed the money. He went, in, he went and borrowed the money somewhere, right? And then, you know, uh, but he didn't say anything, right? That's why it's important to, if you do something, talk to it with your loan originator, right? And he borrowed the money. And it's considered unsecured funds. Well, we're, we're on the contract. We're going through the underwriting phase. And it comes out that the money that he deposited or that he got was from an unsecured loan. Couldn't use it. Couldn't use it. Couldn't use it. Right? Um, so, again, if you are borrowing money for this real estate transaction, any money that you plan on using towards this loan, closing costs, down payment, reserves, right? Any loan that you plan on getting, okay? Um, Please, please, please communicate that with your loan originator and take the proper steps. Can you take out an unsecured loan and close on a loan? Yes, but there's a there's a way you got to go about doing it. Um, you, again, you can't do it within two months of the application, uh, either on credit or deposit into your account. Uh, season it, right? Season it. Uh, let her let her report. Uh, let the payment show up. Let it already be in your bank, right? Um, but you know, be careful there, right? Uh, line D, have you or will you be applying for a mortgage loan on another property, not the property securing this loan, on or before closing this transaction that is not disclosed on this application? Meaning that, okay, uh, we pulled your credit. There's no other loan on there, right? We, we pulled a background check, cable report, whatever. There, you don't own any property out there. But while we're trying to close this loan here, are you trying to get another house? Right? Or you maybe you own the property free and clear, right? But while we're going through this process, are you trying to refinance that home and pull cash out at the same time you're doing it right now? Because if you are, right, it won't show on credit report. And there's no way we can actually know because there's a delay between when you close and when something's reported. Right. So uh, one of the problems back in 2007, 2008 was was people doing multiple loans on multiple or this could just that, that's all the way up until this day. But people doing multiple loans on multiple homes in order to trick their debt to income ratio calculation so they can get all these loans on these different types of properties. That's no go. That's no go. That's that's mortgage fraud. Two D. Have you or will you be applying for any new credit, installment loans, credit cards, on or before closing uh, this loan that is not disclosed on the application? Meaning that, okay, uh, we pulled your credit. We, we got the application, right? And remember I said earlier, your credit report is valid for 120 days, right? It's not on your application. We're going through the process, but you decide to go get a new credit card. You walk into your, your favorite store, you know, Best Buy, whatever case may be. I like Best Buy. So you go into Best Buy, right? And you see that, that big old, you know, 72 inch screen TV, right? And they got the, the new sound system and or whatever, whatever it is that you're into, right? And and you're like, well, ooh, Nelson said that I can't spend no money right now because I need this money to close. So instead of me using the money I got in closing, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get a I'm gonna go get a store credit card. Or I'm gonna put this on credit. 
Oh, oh, Nelson said I'm approved for this loan. Right now I'm pre-approved and I can close on this loan. Pre-approved is different from final approved. But uh, Nelson said I'm pre-approved for this loan. All right, now this is in a bag. I got the money. I got the income. Let's go get a new car. It ain't on my credit. Don't do that, people. Don't do that, people. Because we will find out the loan will get denied then you could potentially lose your earnings money. So just be above the board. Remember, home ownership is more important than anything else when it comes to, um, you know, what you spend or invest your money into. Home ownership, number one. Line E, will this property be subject to a lien that could take priority over the first mortgage lien, such as a clean energy lien paid through your property taxes, okay? So what this means is that is there a lien on your property that will trump this mortgage? That's all they ask. So a lot of these clean, clean energy liens, they'll trump our mortgage, right? Um, IRS, an IRS lien will trump our mortgage, right? Federal lien, stuff like that, trump our mortgage. Property tax lien in certain states, you know, most states, trump our mortgage, right? The lender wants to know that, okay, if we do this loan on this property and you sell or anything goes wrong and this home has to be sold and liquidated, are we getting paid first? That's all they want to know. Are we getting paid first? And if the answer is no, then a lot of lenders are going to say no to your loan, right? So if you know there's something on your property, right, then, then this video is telling you right now, you, you want to disclose it. Now, some lenders might take that risk, right? But let's think about it. If the home is worth $400,000, right? And the loan you're getting on this home is $375,000. So the, 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 the bank, the lender, or whatever, is forking out $370,000 on this home. And then <clears throat> come to find out after closing, um, without, and I don't know how there's a squeak by anybody, but come to find out <clears throat> there's, a, uh, there's a lien that's going to supersede the, the first lien position we thought we had on the on the on your home. And now, you know, the lender is out three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. Well, now, now I ain't gotta worry about that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but it affects everybody else out. Because the 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 lender and the bank is going to need to recoup that that money somehow, some way. That means they're gonna raise their rates and their margin. All right. So just know where you stand. Um and just get your ducks in a row. All right, 5B, about your finances, okay? Find F, are you a co-signer or grantor? You see that right there, uh, uh, business owner? Or a grantor on any debt or loan that is not disclosed in this application, right? So what it's saying is, are you, are you obligated to pay for a loan that's not reported on your credit or disclosed in this application? Plain and simple, right? So, that, so for my business owners, especially, right? You're out there and you're doing your business. So don't get me wrong. You got, you got to do what you got to do in order to get your get your, your business going and, and be profitable and generational wealth for your family. I get it. I'm not, I'm not being argumentative with that. But what I'm saying is this. I don't make the laws. I don't make the guidelines. And what this is specifically saying is if you became a grantor or you co-signed on a debt or a loan that's not reporting to your credit, <clears throat> that's not... um. Uh, does not disclose in this application is filed in some computer on some computer or in some court system or whatever, right? That didn't come up, right? We need to know about it. We need to know about it. And most of the time we're going to find out about it. And if we don't, that, that could be considered mortgage fraud. Could be considered mortgage fraud, especially if it's dated before the loan application or the closing of the home. Line G, are there any outstanding judgments against you? So for those who don't know what a judgment is, basically a judgment is um, um, uh, so a debt that you a debt that you needed to pay, you didn't for whatever reason, um, and uh, it went through the court system. Judge has ruled, ruled you're going to pay this, right? And now uh, there's a judgment or a forced collection uh, uh, against you, right, for repayment. Uh, that's a, that's a judgment. Um, it may or may not be on your credit report. Um, it normally does come up on a cavage report. Again, a cavage report pulls all the records through all the court systems in America to make sure there's no liens and conversations and judgments out there, right? Um, but sometimes stuff do get squeaked 
squeak by because it's not proper filing, right? Don't, um, I want to say this, don't get into a desperate situation because you really, really want something so bad that you're really to fudge numbers or fudge documents or fudge information in order to get there. That is considered mortgage fraud. And again, mortgage fraud is 30 years in jail up to a million dollar fine. It's not worth it. Just be honest. And we can work towards figuring something else out that, that can help you get into a home. Okay. Line H. Are you currently delinquent or in default on any federal debt? Right. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is IRS. I see this with IRS uh, or student loan. Right. Those are the two things I see all the time that comes to uh, H. Um, so delinquent default, meaning that you've missed payments or it, it is considered charged off. Or a collection, something like that. Um, now, IRS or anything dealing with the federal government, let me put it like this. Anything dealing with the federal government, uh, H, if you're delinquent or default on a federal debt, nine out of 10 times, you're not getting a loan. Just being honest, nine out of 10 times, you're not getting a loan unless you have set up a repayment plan uh, and can prove that you've been making payments on time. Uh, some lenders might let that fly, but <clears throat> if you're delinquent or default on a federal debt, it's no go, no go. Just being honest right now. Um, so for those that may be trying to get a home loan right now and, and you know you're delinquent or defaulting on a federal debt, uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a situation about a year ago. Um, uh, this guy was trying to get a home. And um, I worked it up. And, you know, he, he, we was, he was honest about his, his uh, uh, IRS debt. And, um, and I was like, okay, man, you know, we, we can do this, but you got to go get some information from me first, right? You got to tell me what the monthly payment is, and then you got to make those payments on time for at least three months, three consecutive monthly payments on time, a lump sum. So he told me what the payment was. I looked at it, did the structure or whatever. I was like, okay, dude, you can get to a house, but go start that payment, payment plan. Well, I don't know what the guy heard, and uh, but he didn't start the payment plan, and, um, and he went on a contract, right, for a home purchase. And when he went on the contract, you know, came back to him like, all right, man, you know, let's do this. All right. He wasn't pre-approved, by the way. <clears throat> I was like, let's do this. And um, he was still delinquent in default. They started payment plan. Denied. He was either had to pay it in full or he had to, he had to cancel contract and wait three months. And he was so mad. And I was like, I'm, you can't get mad at me because I told you the information that you need to go do. And, and, you know, you didn't go do exactly what I told you to do, Mr. Stout, and now here we are, all right? So, you know, again, it, do stay above the board. Don't try to finesse anything. Don't try to cut corners. Don't try to get one over on the lender, on the underwriter. Uh, trust me, these are professionals. They do this day in and day out. And, you know, uh, you might get past the first line of defense. You might get past the second line of defense. You might get past the third. But you won't get all the way to the end in most places, right? And 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 when people say, oh, I don't know, some people say, oh, well, they should have caught this up front, right? Well, just understand that mortgages is checks and balances on top of checks and balances on top of checks and balances on top of checks and balances, and so on and so forth, and all the way until you close, all the way up until closing day, we are checking and balancing and checking and balancing and looking and crossing T's and dotting I's and reviewing and double reviewing and hey man, look at what I just did that I did in front. That's kind of kind of how it goes. And, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people involved in the process because that's the law. Right. And, you know, we're all humans and we all miss things. Right. Or forget things just like you may miss or forget something. Like, oh, you know, they I remember that I got that lawyer level letter in the, in the mail. And I just yeah, whatever. I'm not going to deal with it. And you totally forgot about it and went about your day and then it came up. Right. Or, you know, people might get sick. People might go on vacation. Things. You know, hands change. We've got to go to the hospital. You know, we recently had a child, right? And we still had to have, we still, I still had business that I had to do, but you know, it made it made the situation uh, for me a little bit more limit, limited, uh, limited on what I could do. Um, uh, but nothing, nothing bad happened. But uh, these are just examples of what can occur. So the the more you help us out by being transparent, honest, remembering everything, providing all the accurate and supporting documentation. The, the easier the process will be. The more you prepare, the better the process will be, right? 
And that's what we are looking for as lenders is uh, we're really looking for um, people that that are bankable, that they got their ducks in a row. Uh, line number HI, uh, are you a party to a lawsuit in which you potentially have a financial, a personal financial liability? So that means, are you going to court right now? It may not be done or whatever, but are you in a part of a lawsuit where you're going to be the one that has to pay out money? That's what we're asking. Or you're going to be the one to suffer financially, right? Uh, line number J, have you conveyed title to any party in lieu of foreclosure in the last seven years? So what that means is that <clears throat> uh, in the last seven years of the application, um, you had a property, right, where you were about to get foreclosed on, but you was able to work something out to where you gave the title away to somebody else and they took on that debt and responsibility and you got a way out. Right? Did something like that, short sale, so on and so forth. Did something like that happen? Right? Oh, not short sale. But did you just give a, a, a property in lieu of foreclosure? Like you were going to lose the home and you just gave the property away in lieu of it. Right? That's what that means. It's a yes or no. Uh, letter K. Uh, within the, the past seven years, have you completed a pre foreclosure sale? So that means you were, you were going to get foreclosed on, but you sold the home in the process of pre-foreclosure, or you did a short sale, meaning that um, you were going to foreclosure, right? The home is going to get taken away from you, but you worked something out with the lender in order to sell the home for less than what was owed on the home, right? So you owe 400,000, you sold it for 300,000, you worked something out with the lender where the $50,000 difference was forgiven or, or wiped away, right? Whereby the property was sold to a third party, there's the rest of it, and the lender agreed to accept less than the outstanding mortgage balance due. There you go. Uh, line number L, have you had have you had property foreclosed? I think this is something, right? Have, have you had a property foreclosed upon in the last seven years? Okay. So again, a foreclosure is you you have a property that has a loan. <clears throat> that you're obligated to make payments to for whatever reason, right? You were not able to make monthly payments. It could be a good reason, it could be a bad reason, it doesn't matter. But whatever reason, um, you, you weren't able to make the monthly payments. You went into delinquency and then you went into default and the sheriff came out and took the home uh, away from you and they foreclosed on the property and they just took it away from you, right? Did something like that happen in the last seven years? Whether it's on credit or not is irrelevant. Has it happened in the last seven years? Line number M. Uh, have you declared bankruptcy within the last seven years? Now, <clears throat> we gotta we gotta understand this specifically. It said, have you declared bankruptcy? Right now, when it says declare, it, it could be a situation where you went to the bankruptcy office and you started the bankruptcy paperwork, but you dismissed it. You declared bankruptcy. Well, I didn't, I didn't actually go forward with it. Nelson, I didn't declare bankruptcy. You had to dismiss. That's how I will show on your credit report. Bankruptcy, dismiss. Chapter seven, dismiss. Whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, now, if you've done that in the seven years, right? Now, um, I'm gonna be honest, I, I, I necessarily don't see all four of these. The ones that we see are chapter sevens. Uh, chapter sevens meaning that uh, <clears throat> you went to the bankruptcy lawyer and you say, I have all this debt, I can't make payments, or whatever, whatever you said to the person. And <clears throat> the uh, court system wiped away all your debt, wiped them all clean. All right, everything's wiped clean, don't worry about it. You know, go back and rebuild your credit and continue living your life. Everything's everything's handled before you through your bankruptcy. And then we see chapter 13. Chapter 13 is a situation in which you go to the bankruptcy attorney and you declare bankruptcy and they say, you know what, we're not wiping everything clean. No, you say, I don't want everything clean. And they say, okay, you're going to have to pay back X amount of dollars per month. And now you're in a payment plan um, that is open with the chapter 13 bankruptcy until you make your very last payment and then it is discharged. Chapter 11, chapter 12, um, in my experience, that, that has more to do with uh, business uh, bankruptcies. 
business, business times. Uh, I'm gonna stay away from that because most of the time I don't see that with business. In my career, I've never seen chapter 11, chapter 12. Uh, after this video, watch, I'll, I'll run into my very first one. Uh, if you, if I do run into you, just know we have options for you. But in my career, this is like the less than, easily less than 5% of people out there. Okay, now, section six, acknowledgement and agreement. Uh, take the time and read through this. This is just a whole bunch of protection stuff that they're talking about, but nothing major. You really need to do that. Just really sign. Section seven, military service. So here's what we want to know, whether you are serving or have served in the military. Now, the question is this, do you or your deceased spouse ever serve or are you currently serving in the United States Armed Forces, okay? Now, when it says your deceased spouse, what they're asking for, they're not asking so much, uh, was, was your spouse a veteran and then passed away? <clears throat> when they say deceased spouse, there's, they're asking, did your spouse um, pass away because of the military? Like, w were they on tour and they died at tour? Or were they were they um, serving with the military, and they caught a um, they caught a disease like uh, Asian Orange and so on and so forth, right? Um, from the military, uh, were they injured? Uh, and the injury from the military was the reason they passed away, right? That's what they're asking for. And you'll state yes or no, and then from there you're going to check everything and apply. First thing is currently serving on active duty with projected expiration of service or tour on this day. <clears throat> so you're gonna say, yeah, I'm in the military now and here's the, here's the expiration of my tour or my service. Now you may re-enlist, right? Or, or they force you to re-enlist. I mean, I, you know, uh, however that works is between you and the armed forces. But if that occurs for you here, just put in the information. <clears throat> Are you currently retired, discharged or separated from service? <clears throat> You know, you just say that. Yeah, I retired from the military. I was discharged from the military. I was separated from service. You just stated. Only period of service was a non-active member of the Reserve or National Guard, right? If you are in the Reserve or National Guard, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're not, then you may still know what I'm talking about. Uh, but if, you, if you're not in the military, you probably absolutely don't know what I'm talking about, unless you have family or friends that serve it. Uh, but um, if it's applicable to you, then you put it down. And then last but not least, if you are a surviving spouse, right? So again, that means your spouse has passed away because of a service-related injury, sickness, whatever, right? And they passed away because they got that during their service tour and you were, you were married to them. Right? or are married to them, however you want to look at it, um, then, you know, you are a surviving spouse entitled to their benefits. Okay. Um, all right. Section eight, demographics. Okay. Now, in this section, we we're asking about your ethnicity, uh, your sex, and your race. Okay. Now, when it comes to answering the question, you can input whatever you want. There's no obligation. There's no bearing on your, your loan qualification here. Um, now, when you're um, filling out this information, of course, you can put in whatever you want, um, whatever you identify as, but just know this, uh, whatever you put down has absolutely no bearing on you getting a loan, right? Um, if, if you even feel or think, well, there's evidence, right? Now you can think, but uh, you can feel like they're discriminating against you, but that may not be the case, okay? But if there is a situation where you are being discriminated on and it's related to this information, then um, <clears throat> filing a complaint with the CFPB is, is in your best interest. But in, as far as mine, uh, as far as where I stand, it doesn't matter if you're you know, white, black, Asian, Native American, uh, Hispanic, blue, purple, green, alien, you know, big, small, disabled or not, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, male, female, or whatever you identify as, right? You deserve home ownership, plain and simple. No more, 
uh, no less, you deserve home ownership. So you input the information accordingly. Um, <clears throat> um, the, most of the time this information here, if, if you don't tell me, I'm not putting it in, plain and simple, right? Um, it, it has no bearing on your ratios or calculation. Uh, now it may have a bearing on um, any type of uh, local agency uh, giving you gifts or grants. Like for instance, you're, if you're a part of a particular uh, group of dynamics of people, I've seen that sometime and they they only give it to this particular, uh, this organization nonprofit uh, gives grants according to having a specific, specific race, sex, or ethnicity. I've seen that, right? And they might want you to put information down on, on the loan application reflecting so. But um, outside of that, when it comes to the loan coming from a lender or a bank or anything along those lines, you, you this does not have a bearing, right? I've been doing this for 10 years and I, I don't get loans denied based off of, off of color uh, or, or gender or anything like that. And the moment, you know, as you can see from the video, you know, I, I personally identify as a uh, as a uh, African American uh, male. Um, um, and the moment, the moment I, I catch wind of anything sideways, you know, I'm the first, I'm your first advocate. I will, I will go down, you know, in history as as one that that I, we're not flying like that. I understand DTI, I understand LTV, I understand credit, I understand repayment. I don't understand it all the way up to the point, but I'm looking at it and, and I'm like, clear as day, like, yeah, no, that's absolutely, I, yeah, and be honest, I had a situation like that before. Um, and she's a homeowner and they were trying to stay, <clears throat> they were trying to say all kinds of stuff. And I was like, yeah, no, that's not the guidelines. Yeah, no, that's not the guidelines. So you're, so, so what you're saying is that you're assuming because of her race that this can't be done, right? And this is she, of course, but I, we, we're not going farther than that. And, um, and, um, you know, the underwriter had to turn their decision around and close the loan. So working, you know, making sure you work with someone that's not going to roll over when an underwriter doesn't like or understand. Now, don't get me wrong. Underwriters, you know, for anyone that's watching this video, underwriters, you're, you are by far my most favorite person in the transaction. You're my favorite, right? Because only working with you can we help people get into homes, right? But um, there are situations where, just like loan originators uh, or any professional for that matter, not everybody is up to par at a certain level, a certain level, right? There may be a level one, level two, low level, uh, which is nothing wrong with that. We all got to start somewhere. But uh, the ultimate thing is home ownership and getting people in the houses. <clears throat> all right. Uh, demogra demographic uh, information was provided through. However, we obtain the information, we put that there. And then section nine is your loan officer information. <clears throat> so whenever you want to know, okay, who is the person that is specifically in charge of putting my loan together and working with the lender, this is the information you'll see here, right? Um, you work with me, you'll see my name here, right? If you see anybody else's name on here besides, you know, the person you thought you were supposed to be working with, just know that that's the person that's actually originating your loan. And that's the person that you need to be in contact with. Uh, unless specify otherwise, but when it gets down to the nitty gritty, you need some answers. This is the person that's responsible for giving you the answers that you need because they are your loan originator. And as you can see, that is the end of the loan application. Uh, if you would, everyone, thank you for taking the time to sit here uh, and go through the full application again. This is here to help you better understand the loan process. The more you know, the more power you have, the better you can move, okay? Uh, everyone deserves home ownership. Everyone can have home ownership, right? There's more than enough houses out there. There's more than enough opportunity out there. And trust me, there's more than enough money out there that banks and lenders want to lend on to you to get you into a home. Uh, please check the description below. There's going to be a lot of information that, uh, that I have there. Uh, if you're ready to start the process, just go ahead and click on the um, uh, start your inquiry or find your inquiry the link there and put a little bit of information about what you're looking to get done when it comes to a home purchase. And then we can set up a time in which we can talk. Uh, be on the lookout for my uh, my book, um, How to Buy a Home with a Loan. That'll be in the description as well. Join my Facebook group. Uh, like, subscribe to the video. Please leave a comment. Tell your friends and family about this channel. And if there's something specific you want to hear and I haven't gotten to yet, please drop it in a comment. Let me know what you want, to, want me to make a video about what we want to talk about, what you need to get educated and get empowered about.
But just know this, right? If you're renting a home now, you're paying a mortgage. You're paying a mortgage. You're not paying your mortgage. You're paying your landlord's mortgage. So home ownership is number one. If you're going to pay yourself first, best way to pay yourself is by having a home and paying down the principal or converting your money into equity. See you all on the other side of home ownership. Morgan Sensei out.